Well, I've been a uh, an avid reader of your books for for many years, and you now have a new book out called Happier Than God. Now, and I think that there's a little bit of controversy about the title. Yes. How does how does one become happier than God? Well, you know how I like to use that phrase is the way people use the, the phrase. Uh, He's got more money than God. You know, so how, how wealthy is he? He has more money than God. In other words, it's the ultimate superlative. So to be really honest with you and dreadfully transparent, I just chose the title because it was catchy, and people would ask the same question you asked, and hopefully they'd pick up the book and say, what is this supposed to be? And they'd turn around the, to the back of it and take a look at it. So, But that's what I really meant by it. It's just the ultimate superlative. You can be so happy in life, you can actually be happier than God. Uh, your books are somewhat of an evolution over, over the years, and... Uh, the one you're most known for is Conversations with yeah, God. Sure. It's a series of books. Uh, what was that, 15, 16 years ago when you wrote Conversations? 1995, whatever that makes it, 11, 12 years ago, 13 years ago. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, time flies. How did that come about, Conversations with God? You know, Ed, I had reached a, a, just a terrible place in my life where nothing was going right. My, my career was going downhill. I had a career in broadcasting and television, I might add. You've done much better than I have. I don't know about that. But. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my, my relationship with my significant other has, was collapsing around me. Uh, and my health was going downhill as well. Nothing was working, actually. And I couldn't understand why. And I finally woke up one night in the middle of the night in a fit of absolute frustration and anger. And I was walking through the house and I was going like, what does it take to make life work? You know, what have I done to, des to deserve a life of such continuing struggle? And somebody tell me the rules. You know, I'll play. Just give me the rule book. And I sat down on the couch. It's 4.20 in the morning. And uh, as you and I are sitting here, I heard a voice. And the voice said, Neil, do you really want answers to all these questions? Or are you just venting? Now, you know, I've had a lot of discussion in the past 15 years. Was that voice real? Was it imagined? Was it you know, something in my head? But it doesn't really matter to me because what happened was right after that, I began receiving, I want to say, incredible information. Like, you know, ask and you shall receive. Answers to all those questions that I had asked and answers to questions I never knew existed. And they started coming so fast, I had a yellow legal pad on the table in front of me. I picked up the, the pad and started writing down what I was hearing. Now, something interesting happened, Ed. As I began writing down what I was hearing, the answers that I received brought up other questions. So I would write down, well, what is, I don't understand. What does that mean? How can that be? And I started, and I'd get the answer to that. And I wrote another question, get an answer to that. Before I knew it, I was involved in a non-paper dialogue that went on for many, many hours, and in fact for many years. Once I got, you know, that, that dam burst, and this, this just continued, it goes on to this very day. I call that dialogue Conversations with God, because that's how I experience it. It wound up being a book that uh, some people have read. Mm -hmm. Now, some people would interpret that to mean, well, God is actually talking to, to, uh, to Mr. Walsh. He's but that's not really what you're saying, or is it what you're saying? No, it is not. Well, it is and it isn't. It, uh -huh. it, God is talking to Mr. Walsh, but not only to Mr. Walsh, not to Mr. Walsh exclusively, but to everyone. And the, the point of the books is that God is talking to everyone all the time. The question is not to whom is God talking. The question is who's listening. And what, what was your, did you have a, a religious background at that time? Yeah, I did, sure. Uh, well, at that time, maybe not, I wouldn't say. I had a religious background, for sure. Mm -hmm. I was born uh, and raised in a, in a very staunchly religious family, actually. My, my parents were Roman Catholic, and I grew up in the Catholic faith. I, I wanted to become a Catholic priest when I was a young boy, uh, and my father stopped that. He said, no, when you're 18 or 19, you can make that decision, but you're not going to make it when you're 12. And so he stopped me from going into the seminary. Uh, and when I was 19 or 20, in fact, I had discovered other delights in life, and I wasn't uh, that interested anymore in being celibate. So uh, I, di I did not go into the Catholic priesthood. And ultimately, I kind of moved away from the Catholic religion itself, moved into um, a deeper, actually lifelong exploration of all the things that people believe about God. I looked at all the world's religions and all the world's belief systems one by one, rather systematically, to see what it was that I didn't quite understand the understanding of which would change everything. So is, is that a, um, a buffet for you today, or, is, or do you follow a specific religion? I don't follow a specific religion. I do have a thought system, though, that, that, that kind of has been given to me through the Conversations with God books. It's a whole, I want to say, cosmology. And uh, loosely, the cosmology suggests really that uh, there is no one true path, one true faith, one true religion. There is no singular path, let's put it that way. I really shouldn't say there's no one true path. I think they're all true paths, actually, every one of them. But there is no singular path. That is, it seems to me now that any path we take, if we do it with purity, with honesty, with integrity, with a 
showed real deep willingness and a desire to get to know God and to live a better life, I think we can get there. And I don't think that God says, well, you took the wrong path, and therefore you're not welcome home. I don't think God says that. And what, what motivated you to write uh, about happiness? Well, because I observed that most people are not happy, or at least they're not happy as much of the time as they would like to be. And I think that's because people have a thought about life itself. See, I don't think that most people think that life is supposed to be happy. I think that people think that life is a test, which it's not, or that life is a school, which it's not. Or worse yet, I think people think that life is some kind of a proving ground where you have to demonstrate that you're somehow worthy to be here and much less worthy to return to where you were thrown out of where you didn't want to leave to begin with. So I think that there's a whole thought construction around that and that people out of their thoughts create a space where they can't be happy even if they want to be. So I started asking some questions about that. Why is it that so many people are so unhappy? And for that matter, why is it that I was unhappy so much of my life? Like I said before, give me the rules. And so God did give me the rules, and I I got them. They're really very simple. There are three of them. You want to know what they are? Yes, please. Okay. (laughs) Rule number one. And by the way, before I tell you They've been waiting so many years for these rules. (laughs) (laughs) And you know what's interesting? They're not new. You know, nothing I'm going to say here today is going to be Uh new. No one's going to go, oh, I never thought of that before. As a matter of fact, they've been given to us in all the holy scriptures, in the writings of philosophers and saints and sages throughout the ages. So there's nothing new to say here. But the real question is not what's new, but why aren't we listening to what's been told to us over and over again? The rules are really very simple. There are three of them. Number one, what you think you create. What you think you create. You bet. Okay, so uh, uh, your thoughts are your reality. Your thoughts create your reality, for Mm -hmm. sure. Your thoughts create your experience of what it is that is being brought to you in life, by life, through life. And it's your thought about that that creates your internal experience of it. I'll talk more about that in a minute. But this, and then the second rule is that what you say you produce. And the third rule is that what you do you experience, especially what you do to others. Now, and you talk about this in your book. This sounds a lot to me like the secret. It is. And um, and which has you know been very well publicized with movies, books, Oprah, yeah. that that type of thing. Yeah. Um, but but you feel that the secret leaves out a, a vital component. I think it stops short, and I'm sorry that it does. But it's okay for what it is. It, but the secret is kind of like a primer of what I call creation reality, or the process by which we create our lives, and it leaves out a huge element, which I call the higher power divinity, the beloved, and some people call it God or Allah or, or, or you know Yahweh or Jehovah or whatever name we, we choose to use to describe that larger part of life that's bigger than we are, but part of who we are and we are part of what that is. And there's not a lot of, in fact, there's hardly any discussion of that in The Secret. And the second thing that I thought that the movie and the book left out, I don't want to denigrate it because it is what it is, but, I, but I, what it left out also was a sense of a larger way to use this wonderful power, this wonderful law of attraction. The Secret talks about, you know, they show pictures of getting a better car and, and the perfect relationship and diamonds suddenly appear around the ladies and even the five-year-old or eight-year-old kid, the bike is outside, the you know, it's all about me, me, me. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with wanting the best that life has to offer. But it says nothing, not a single thing about how to make a world a better place, how to bring peace on earth and goodwill to humans everywhere. And you know, when I, when I watched the movie, I thought, gosh, if this, if this power really exists, and if it is that power full, why aren't we using it to change life on the planet? So this book talks about how to invoke the source of that power, which I call God or the highest part of divinity, the highest part of wisdom and understanding clarity in the universe, and how to bring that through not only to make a better life for ourselves, but most importantly to make a better life for everyone whose life we touch. Because, Ed, I have discovered in my life that that is the real secret, and that's not discussed in the movie The Secret. So in a sense, this is the secret behind the secret, and that secret is what every religion on the face of the earth has said, each in their own way, do unto others as you would have it done unto you. You know, there's a gentleman here named Louis Weiner. And he was uh, a part of the, the family that created this very television station. Right. And Lewis had a, had a philosophy in life, and no one ever forgot this man. He was an extraordinary human being. His philosophy was, make sure that the other person always gets the better of the deal, and you'll never be other than successful. That's the secret. And it's not mentioned in the movie. It's not mentioned in the book. But it's, I think, entirely appropriate it should be mentioned on this television station that Lewis was so much a part of creating.